Ja. Ach. Oh my goodness, how exciting to meet all of you. And I, you know, I was looking at, look at these. Yes. My goodness, look at all this wonderful work. I'm an artist, sculptor, and you know Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, African-American Narragansett Pequot. Yes, I broke the mold, you know. I was the first colored graduate from the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, you, you, you call it uh, RISD, right? Yes, <laughs> cheeky, yes. Oh, I'll call it RISD as well. Uh, so I was, that was 1918. Well, yes, I did pass away from Providence in 1960 um, at 70 years old. Uh, but I fly around to see what's happening, and especially to come and visit with you today here in the Newport Art Museum, where I had experienced a shining moment in my life, but I'll tell you about that later. And also, oh my goodness, all these great things. There are colored folks in these paintings, aren't there? <laughs> yes, and I, I see that Bob Dilworth was the, I'd like to meet that fella. Well, anyway, and especially because Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney sculpture, the exhibit, exhibit in the Cushing there, she has sculptures of wounded soldiers and things. She had a very dear heart. I knew her. She also supported me from time to time. We were dear friends. Also bought one of my pieces, yes. Oh, so this is a lovely gathering. Oh, yes. This is kind of like the Le Salon Carré in uh, Le Louvre, Paris. Oh, Salon Carré, uh, that is French for the square room. So, well, this is kind of a square room. <laughs> so today we will have the Salon Carré à la Newport Art Museum, yes, <laughs> oh yes. So I'm here, you like my cape? Yes. Oh. Well, I'm here today with bits of my diary, bits of my diary, and bits of letters, and bits of incidents, and uh, oh, my memories, my memories, they are still so much alive, so much alive, yes. Well, all right, let's see what I'm going to t talk to you about and, you know, uh, yes, life, life, life. You know, I broke the mold. As I was born in a small mill town, Arctic, Warwick, Rhode Island, you know it? Yes, oh yes, it was a small mill town. I was born in March 9th. 1890, just 25 years after the Civil War. That was just 25 years after emancipation. And my parents, oh, my parents, well, they were extraordinary people. They had extraordinary energy and wisdom and activity. They were struggling, hard working, hard working, hard working. Oh, <laughs> I had to hide my sketches from them. You know, as a teen, I used to sneak off and do domestic work to pay for the art tutors and, and all. And, uh, oh, <laughs> never mind all that dawdling and doodling. There's no colored artists around here. You best you get yourself a job in the mill after high school like everybody else. Ha, 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 ha. Working with those deafening, dangerous, spinning and weaving machines, the air reeking of bleach and dyes and a cloud of cotton dust, and kowtowing, dying for those former slave-owning mill owners, the Knights, the Lippets, oh, Royal Mill, Pontiac Mill, Lippet Mill. <laughs> now, I was an artist. Well, you could be a teacher, but teach your own kind, though. My father, oh father, father's father. 
Father got his name, actually, got his name from the man who held father's father, father's African father, enslaved in Rhode Island. Yes, that was my African grandfather. He married the woman who bought his freedom, and she was my Narragansett Pequot grandmother. So I am African, American, Narragansett Pequot, Narragansett Pequot, African American. Sculptor. Well, 1913, 1913, with a little bit of scholarship, some from Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, and saving money from um, cleaning houses for snooty whites, uh, I, I was accepted to Rhode Island School of Design. Oh, yes. Finally, this, I studied all the classical art courses and from uh, the creative inception all the way to the end product. And I excelled in portraiture, too. Yes, well, at that time along came this uh, handsome, debonair, colored fellow from Brown University, Francis Ford, the man I married in 19... 15. Well, I graduated in 1918. I took a few more courses in 1919. And, well, this was post-war, post-World War I. And, and there were no jobs. And, and colored folks coming up from the South looking for jobs in the North, and they brought new ways. Oh, the Harlem Renaissance was just beginning. Oh, yes, and they, oh, the music, and oh, there were, oh, writers and filmmakers and artists and actors and all kinds of, and, and they were reformers, reformers among them. Yes, the prejudice and the racism was just brutal, and it was everywhere. And I wrote to my friend, County Cullen, uh, poet, County Cullen, you know him. <clears throat> I wrote that, let's see if I, what I want, what I want is one man to take the whole race upon his shoulders and under the stress of that weight, with an individual voice, to hurl out in a poignantly convincing manner the soul of that race. Well, of course, you know that was W.E.B. Du Bois you know, who started the NAACP in, in, in uh, 1910. Yes, and was the first colored man to get a PhD from Harvard. Yes. Well, Francis, the man I married, he left Brown with no, no thought at all that we uh, were living on my father's dime. We lived up on Benefit Street at that time in father's house. Ah, oh, Francis, Francis, Francis. So it was the post-war recession, as I've said, and there was oh, not much work to be done. So I, you know, I did a little stenography, and I was catering, and uh, that's called serving for white folks as fancy parties and things. And um, my portrait business was slow. It was very slow. I even advertising in Newport and New York, but suddenly I got an invitation to exhibit a painting. There was one stipulation, one stipulation, that this brown face not stand beside my work at the opening reception. Oh, my work, my people. They have built and powered this country with their sweat and blood. But my African negritude and my Indian blood made me socially unacceptable. Hmm? So, with the help of one of the nation's most elite whites, yes, whites, art patron, artist Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, I had turned my lovely black backside on this country and went to Paris. <laughs> to study among the greats where blacks were free, were free to flourish our talent. Oh, it was wonderful to have this experience. And wait, 
uh, Paris, by the way, was home to uh, colored artists before me, before me, let's see, uh, oh, 1866, the Ojibwe uh, African-American sculptor, Edmonia Lewis, she uh, went to, through Paris on her way to live in Rome forever. Oh, Annie Anderson, the first African-American woman poet, uh, 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 painter um, that was recorded that we know. And Meta Vaux, Warwick Fuller, the sculptor of uh, a few years. Um, it, uh, Ethiopia Awakening, a wonderful statue. We must look for that. And well, a few years before that, of course, Henry Osawa Tanner, the great painter, went to Paris. And that was a, about a year or so before I was born. So they were all there before me. Um, and my time, there were West Indians and Creoles and Africans and stuff. Augusta Savage, the great Augusta Savage, came to visit me while I was there. And uh, let's see, oh yes, in 1925, the Josephine Baker. Well, of course, she was an artist of a different kind. Uh, wiggling bananas and, and other things. <laughs> yes, so. so, at any rate, I was determined. I was doggedly determined to succeed, despite the back pain, the back pain, which eventually became excruciating back pain. Yes, and begging, always begging, begging. Well, I was an artist. I was an artist. So, August 11, 1922, I was 32. I arrived in Paris and I went to my first place, 36 Avenue de Chatillon. I fell flat into bed. I was in bed for almost two months. I was weakened for all, and bitter and hurt from being in the U.S. and the work that I had to do and whatnot. And also, I had, had saved things. I had savings. But I loaned to a worthless brother, and I got to Paris with $380. Well, today, what would that be today? Three, about $3,000 in your money today. Could you live in Paris? $3,000? It wasn't going to last very long, especially with supplies, art supplies, and, and, and expenses and all kinds of... Well, anyway, when I rose, I went to work on my first piece with a calm assurance and a savage pleasure of revenge that this was going to be a living thing. It would breathe. It would be a master stroke. Well... I worked on it. I worked on it for uh, two months, two months with all mornings, and then for a month, all day. This was difficult work. But then two weeks before it was finished, the money was all gone. Well, I had to finish. I had to finish that bust. Well, at the time I was working in a studio of uh, a young woman. It was better lit. She was a student at Ecole de Beaux Arts. And I, well, she, she, her chatter, uh, and, and, and there used to be teas and cakes and whatnot, and, and her chattering and her giggling, they kind of left me a little empty. So uh, it must have shown because at some point there were no more teas and cakes. So one morning when she left to go to L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts, I stole a piece of meat and potato from the dish of the dog who ate very well. And I ravished it. I ravished it. Well, moving along, um, 1924, not, 1924, Gertrude uh, paid for classes, a whole course of classes at L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts, private classes, with the great sculptor Ambroise Segoffin. Oh, my word. And then in 1926, 1926, L&D Sharp of the Rhode Island Brown and Sharp family, L&D Sharp donated to 
Rhode Island School of Design Museum to RISD. My, uh, my discontent. No, she, do when she donated my white marble head, at that time it was my white marble head, called Silence. Silence, silence. The unifying quality of body, mind, and spirit. Ha, huh, yes. Well, living in Paris was quite a challenge. It was quite a challenge. Oh, oh there was that hole uh, where there was no gas, there was no toilet, and the winter time when the water trickling down the walls froze on the walls. And there was elsewhere where the public toilets were so filthy, I, my stomach heaved when I approached them. I, I didn't bathe regularly. So then I moved to a, a, a little shack in the zone. The zone is a little, uh, well, no, it wasn't little, it was large. Uh, it was, but it was a filthy, filthy section outside the walls of Paris. Yes. Well, I would, in the morning, I would go to Le, Pau, Le Col de Beaux-Arts, uh, which, uh, and it was quite some distance to go there in Paris, and then in the afternoon, cutting stone, heavy work, in my studio. And I had a little garden, and I planted, cultivated, winter and summer, and oh, there were, oh, a year of sleepless nights and all, and I was beginning to, by 25, summer, 1925, I was very ill, I was weak, and my legs were collapsing, and, and my friend forced me to go to the American hospital. And I went, I arrived emaciated and weak. The doctors and the nurses decided that I was a drug addict. Oh, yes they did. And they treated me as such. Well, eventually I left there. And when I returned to my shack in the zone, I was so horrified, I made some batik, sold it. And then I took a six-month sublet in Paris, Rue Versingetorix. Yes, and there I began my first life-size statue, Volonté. Volonté in French, that in English means will, will. Oh, that even there, you know, waiting for the six months, I had a fever to execute and plans and, 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 and this place was there were bugs crawling on the walls and oh, there was a sink over there with a, with a um, faucet with a rubber tip on it that was ready to squirt at any minute. A penis on the wall. Oh, yes. Well, finally. I did move to my studio in Montparnasse, where I would live for the next eight years that I lived in Paris. And so, I want to read a little bit to you from my diary. And I must say that after all of that, I began to realize that beauty is conceived in paradise, but it is formed in the depths of hell. Yes. And my diary, December. 1925, the man I married, coming to see me with a great bunch of roses. There he lies on the couch, asleep now. Oh God, oh God, he came drunk. Again, Christmas Eve, yes, Christmas Eve, Christmas, I, I felt so terribly alone. But who am I and what? But I was cutting stone and happy to be cutting stone. From my diary, so we're running to a year in the future, to 1926 September. I say, how swiftly the happy days slip by. It's only the two unhappy ones that linger and drag. A month has fled with all the battles fought and won and all the glory that comes with success. But poverty, 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 detestable poverty. 
how you trail behind me, ever screeching out your presence. But think you to ever make me a subject of your kingdom? Never. But though I die of hunger, I shall never bend a knee to your majesty. But yet, what new phases of poverty are there for me to learn? To regain or going without eating? <laughs> That's common. To regain my health, my strength, only to lose it again through fasting. It is a periodical occurrence that comes so frequently that it neither interests nor frightens me. So, poverty, weary not yourself trying to humiliate me. Ah, oh, <laughs> poverty, your grace. I accept your challenge. Hmm. Well, 1927, shortly after, I forced myself to appeal to the Student Boston Fund, Louise Brooks there. And let me read you some snatches of the letter that it was dear Miss Brooks, and I also apologize that I don't do this, and, but I had to. And I, you know, I want to work. This is no vain idea, but a fire that burns within me. You know, it's a force that compels my obedience. It's stronger than myself. And even in the face of discouraging conditions, I cannot stop. I must go on. All each of life's problems that I uh, overcome, they make me bigger and richer for my work. And I match myself against life forces, but this thing, money, or the lack of it, is too crushing. It keeps me from working. I'm a fighter, oh, I'm a fighter. I stop only when I drop, yes. Now, sculpture is an expensive medium, I know, but I have not chosen it, it has chosen me. So I want to work, I want to work, I live for that alone. Nancy Elizabeth Prophet. Well, the letter did get me a small amount of money, uh, well, it, it was $30 a month at that time. At this time, $400 it would be a month. That's quite a bit. Still with expenses and all, and I was grateful. But it did stop. It stopped in a few years, very quickly as it had started. Let's go to 1929 now. 1929, oh, I didn't have to be in the United States, but the Boston Independent uh, Society of Artists uh, exhibited one of my pieces, and the Société des Artistes Français, they accepted the first piece that I submitted to them. Oh, I was so excited. Um, in the meantime, the man I married uh, brought very little to the marriage, and uh, I refused to bend an inch. I sold a piece of my work, my work, sent him off to America. Oh, the end of that epic. I had inner strength returning, inner strength. And I was alone cutting wood, cutting my stone and feeling and carving wood. Cutting stone, carving my survival is what I did. Yes. So, oh yes, also that July, County Cullen. County Cullen threw a tea party for what he called a charming lady of manners. Me. <laughs> yes, uh, to celebrate uh, the acceptance of my piece to the Société des Artistes Français. Oh, what a joyous afternoon. Well, there were so many people there. I can't you know, I remember all that was there. And there, were, there were artists and there were entertainers and professionals and, and oh, let's see. Oh, yes, Gertrude Curtis Thompson, the first African-American woman dentist, was there. And she, uh, oh, she invited us all to her place in Montmartre for a uh, July, uh, Fourth of July celebration, cabbage, cabbage and ribs, um, because this was in July. 
and oh, there were, who else? Oh, Zadie Jackson, she, actress, singer, dancer, Zadie Jackson. Uh, she, <laughs> planning another cocktail party. And you know, Casca Barnes, County's elegant gay friends, and Casca and his friends, they all spent a lot of time in Paris. Um, Harold Jackman, County's lover, known as the handsome, most handsome man of Harlem. Oh, they were, so, oh, and I tell you, there was more than tea being poured <laughs> at this thing. <laughs> so, well, shortly after I, I went on my first trip back to the United States. That was, I arrived in time, 1929, for the, oh, the Wall Street crash. Oh, and there were people leaping from buildings and uh, lo losing everything, losing everything. Blacks, Indians, coloreds, poor whites, everyone had to beg. And they held on to their only possession, which was their dignity. And for me, I, I was uh, hosted by Madame Dubois, a dear friend. And well, there were all the artists of the Harlem Renaissance who came and uh, museum. Metropolitan Museum of Art gave me a sketch permit. Uh, it, was, it, it was quite a time there. And uh, not only was I sketching, people were buying. Ellen D. Sharp and Eleanor B. Green. Doesn't sound familiar? Well, a long time ago, all right. Eleanor B. Green, she was the first lady of Rhode Island. She was Senator and then Governor Green's sister. And as he was unwedded, uh, then she was the first lady. Well, they, they bought, together they bought my discontent, my cowled head of discontent, and donated it, permanent collection, to the Rhode Island School of Design, to the RISD Museum, <laughs> yes. So I returned to Paris and I had usual money problems and my, my diary, I'll read to you from the diary. <clears throat> that he who loves and seeks beauty must acquire the power to produce it from within. He must have perfection, must attain that quality in his own creation. So live for this, ask no more. And to attain this, one must seek as instructor the great universal creator, for only there is true power. Yes. Well, by March 1931, I was penniless again, and I, I wrote to W.E.B. that I would come through or I would go under. And if nobody else cared, neither did I. Well. He was a bit disturbed, and I, let me read some snatches from his letter. May 18, 1931. My dear Elizabeth, I am disturbed. You are in some way hurt by my actions or attitude, and the attitude of colored and white America. No one in France or America appreciates you as an artiste more than I. The colored people of America, far as they know about you, are proud of your work. You had a marvelously fine reception by the white artistic world. Perhaps you do not understand that in the United States today, at least six million men and women workers idle, perhaps 10 million all philanthropy has been cut down, all business curtailed, bread lines everywhere. I, even in prosperous times, have little chance to solicit our white philanthropy in the United States. Most persons who have wealth in the habit of giving us subscriptions, they are inimical to my attitude, particularly my frank and unpopular writing and talking. I do not know rich people. I am not 
persona grata to the great foundations. And even in good times, even in good times, I cannot do much for those who need, deserve help. In bad times like this, I am quite powerless. And he went on to say, understand how you have been left to struggle alone. You yourself realize this is the fate of genius. It does not make you any less great. It is the price that people like you have to pay all too often. And I hope you will continue to write me from time to time. Continue to write me from time to time. I persisted. I persisted. Well, in a few years, next year, 1932, my second visit to the United States, I was invited to join the Newport Art Association. Yes, and they did now call the Newport Art Museum. <laughs> Maud Howe Elliott was one of the founders. She was the daughter of abolitionist suffragette Julia Ward Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Oh yes, she was. So I was invited to exhibit and my, my, my uh, Congolais, my, all my heads, the wooden Congolais, um, discontent, uh, peace, poise, um, and um, peace and poise. They were all there in that entry, that, where you just came from, through the entry, yes? Okay, they were all out there. This part of, this is not, wasn't here, wasn't there then at that time. And my white marble head of silence. Well, ecstatic, joyful celebration. So many guests. Oh yes, the Whitneys, the Vanderbilts, the Astors, the Hursts, foreign dignitaries. Oh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Sheldon Whitehouse. I believe you know her grandson. <laughs> Floating around in DC somewhere. Oh yes. So some days later, the jury awarded me the grand prize for my discontent. My discontent, the head that County Cullen said might stand for the very spirit of revolt and rebellion. I won, I won, I broke the mold. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, I broke the mold. But we cannot forget that prior, before, before I was even born, that Newport had its own 18th and 19th century accomplished blacks. Oh, there were business, there were entrepreneurs, there were politicians. Oh, they were oh, abolitionists. And, what, and the Free African Union Society had been in Newport since 1780. Yes, so I wasn't the first, but we were here. We were here. And I want to read you some of the reviews. I'm not going to read all of them because there were so many of them, but I was, <laughs> okay. So, and they were all rave. They were all rave. Newport, Providence, New York, Boston, and, and said a true sculpture in every sense of the word. An Indian woman, <laughs> Negress, wins the prize at Newport. <laughs> Whatever you call me, I won. <laughs> Yes. And then shortly after my Congolais, the wooden head Congolais, which was inspired uh, in, in Paris by the, um, all the African heads that I saw at l'exposition coloniale, uh, internationale coloniale in Paris. Um, <clears throat> and, th and that was a very, oh, it was all of France's colonies. It was exquisite art, but France had, stolen these works 
and was showing them as their possessions. Yes. So and, and so anyway, my my after I won here, um, Gertrude purchased my Congolette and put it in uh, the Whitney Museum permanent collection. You can see it. I flew through there once, and if you are looking for it in documentation, you will see the front, the face of it. However, if you go to the Whitney and you walk around the back, you will see the bark from the piece of wood that I carved it from. Mm, yes. All right. And here's another review, the Boston Vose. Boston Vose, V-O-S-E, started in Providence in 1843, and then it moved to Boston, to the Newberry Street. All right. They, they said, um, she carves her own. <laughs> Miss Prophet is not weak. She is not clay, but rather marble, stone, and wood. And she is not, uh, she's a sculptor and not as many a modeler. In other words, someone just playing around with the clay. Oh, I mean, that's fun to do, and I hope more people do. But he said I was more than that. Well, returning to Paris, it was very difficult. So in 1939, I left. 1939, I became the first African-American woman to teach at Atlanta University. And that would be at Spelman. Yes. And the added attraction was I was also Narragansett Pequot. Yes. Well, they turned the uh, power plant into uh, um, a studio, uh, offices for me. Um, I had a number of exhibits there, and they would said that the newspaper, the student newspapers, said, this is the best we've had in five years. Community members were, were invited to be part of this exhibit, and, uh, the, and, and these exhibits, and the students, of course, and, and faculty. And uh, at one of them, I made a cloak, a, a cloak with embedded, studded with beads from my Narragansett Pequot grandmother. Yes. Oh, I longed for Paris. But I was teaching my own kind. And uh, well, students were all had to go to uh, talks in a chapel. Now Du Bois. And Du Bois was very instrumental in getting me there. And Du Bois was a lackluster speaker. But on his 70th birthday, he started his talk with I've had my share of wine, women, and song. Well, those hot little ears perked right up, and they stayed open for the duration of that talk. <laughs> yes. Atlanta's Jim Crow, evil, pure evil. We were allowed nowhere near the white art sea. Not at all, not at all. And I, I mean, I felt cut off from civilization from all that is a human. I wrote an article, I wrote an article, and, and some of it, you know, I said it is difficult to believe that human beings could be proud in such a tragic, tragic plight. And that of us Negroes in Atlantis, Atlantic. Yeah. Atlanta, Atlanta, oh, Atlanta, pure evil. And I also said, Intelligent America and her educators, they're attempting to give some cultural education to the people. This can no longer be neglected if America is to take her place in the civilized world. And I think that is resonating today as well from what I hear forever. Oh, I longed for Paris. Oh, yes, father, 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 I am teaching my own kind. But this was seven precious years away from my art, away from my art. Well, 1944, Du Bois retired from Atlanta University. 
1944, I retired from Spelman to home, Providence, bleak, absolutely bleak. Yes, so Du Bois's suggestion that I find some rest um, and without the funding to do a tropical escape, I found myself embroidering in the Rhode Island Mental Hospital, is what they called it. Well, I wasn't in a terrible, uh, one of the really um, stronger uh, sections, uh, but there were people wandering with vacant eyes and, and there were some moans and cries that the food was slop, there was no rest here, this was no healing place for me, I left. I left. And then I was in and out of New York, sculpting with high hopes. And then father failing and I returned to Providence and, and found myself spewing ceramic Indian heads in a local factory and sculpting in a dark attic on Broad Street. Oh, excruciating back pain, excruciating back pain. And, well, I... No teaching. No, there was no teaching for me. There was no teaching at all. So, six months. Six months of washing, dressing, feeding, mopping daily after small children and a pregnant mother. And I cooked, I decorated many cakes, and I, I, I made a mask for one of the children. Suddenly, fired! But I was still a capable artist, and I wanted recognition and funding and all, and yet I ruffled Cedric Dover. Cedric Dover was an art critic, and this was in 1959. I forbade him. I forbade him to feature me in his upcoming book on Negro art as Negro only. Well, for years, ever since I, when I mentioned my Indian blood, it was said, oh, that she did not want to be black, she did not want to be Negro. Hogwash! Cedric Dover, he was white and a parent was Indian, British and Indian. And he, woo, did not want to be called half caste. I'm proud of my beauteous blending of African and Indian, Narragansett Pequot. And I want to be known as such. Well, 1960 and 70 years old, in my father's house, was just a few houses down from the altar of the Assumption Church that I had joined. The front of the church, the entrance of the church was on Potter's Avenue. And the altar was a few doors from Father's house. My heart was done. It was done. Human life, no more. But in my eternal life, I am shining, grateful for being given the wherewithal to accomplish all I did through all those trials. Oh, my works were shown in the great salons of Paris, prestigious museums in the United States. Oh, Anderson Gallery, New York, 56th Street Gallery, New York, and, and, and uh, whatever, Philadelphia Museum, the Boston Bows. And they're living forever in the Whitney, yes, and the Brooklyn Museum, they found something. And also, yes, RISD Museum. <laughs> oh, and yes, my reflection, my knowing that one must look to the light was in my piece, my long bar relief, a long wooden piece sculptured called Facing the Light. Well, it was loaned by the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society to the Newport Art Museum some years ago, and it is upstairs, and it is upstairs. And there's a chirpy, chirpy young lady that, I, um, Kristen Searles, is that her name? She put it in 
the studio gallery in a very prominent place, very well lit. So when you ever get a chance to go up and see it. And I must say that you will get more than just the work of art, which I, I'm, happy, I'm happy with that. But it is also revealing of the times. Because you see, at that time, men ran the world, yes. Yes, and we wrote and we said he and him and that kind of thing. And, but today, you all know that that's different, right? There are many women in prominent positions, many women making such great contributions to society. But you will see the reflection of the times in that because the man is in a prominent position and the woman is shielding herself from the light. But I did not, I did not. And I don't think many women did, because you all wouldn't have been here if they hadn't, right? Yes. So please go up and see. Oh, I am so proud of my people. I am so proud of my people, my African um, enslaved, and my oh, yeah, Indian, Narragansett, Pequod, the first peoples of the world, all the descendants. From them came great intellects innovators, artistry, leaders that continue to influence and serve this nation and the world. Yes. So, and I'm so happy to have met all of you. And I am Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, African, American, Narragansett Pequot, sculptor,